Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Franconia. Franken in German, a region that is not precisely defined because the original stem duchy was not so precisely defined, where at least there wasn't properly um, Franconian people as such, um, like ethnically compact on, on the uh, same basis of, of the same Franks, for example, that came, however, from elsewhere, and as we will see, the name of the region is, is of course, uh, after uh, the Franks, but because this was essentially the first part of Germany was starting to be colonized by the Merovingians once they had established their Gallic um, empire, fundamentally. Um, and that, however, we can locate, um, also looking at the modern German uh, states, um, north of uh, the one of Bavaria, uh, including parts of Baden-Württemberg and uh, South Thuringia, as well as uh, Esse, um, and uh, yet being defined also by a distinct cultural and linguistic heritage. Right, Franconia is, is a wide area that stretches, as you understand here, uh, in lands that were historical Franconia, but were eventually part of, uh, became part uh, of, of other uh, land up, for example, Nuremberg, that is the, the most important um, center, at least in the Middle Ages, the largest um, free commune of the German kingdom is in Bavaria, despite being historical Franconia. So this, this aspect is fascinating, uh, of course. So in, in accordingly, when you look at the migration era, where more or less the, the stem duchies in what would become uh, Germany proper had the fact of being formed, you see that this era is, uh, I posted here even um, among the, f the very first pictures, like a, a map of the conquest of Clovis, etc. And there is like a series of question marks right around this area, as you understand here, populated by the Ripuarian Franks, the Alemanni, the uh, the Bavarians, the, the Thuringians. By the way, I made some videos about uh, these peoples. I talked about the Duchy of Bavaria, established, let's say, in, in the mid 6th century. We talked about the Thuringians. So there, there is some hint to the thing. We know that this area was populated by Elb Germans, right? So we will explain this better because the um, at least the early connections were with peoples like the Marcomanni. Right at this point, was a, a connection also with Bohemia. There are even some Slavs that uh, f fundamentally populate in the the, the north and the eastern part um, of uh, of this the, of historical Franconia. Uh, there was no strong c concentration of power locally. Right, uh, most of this area had not been under. Um, the Romans that had at some point tried to establish like a more advanced limes, especially after they had consolidated the so-called Agri Decumates, more or less today's Swabia, and that in fact uh, encompassed some, um, you know, fortified some uh, some parts of the Main River that is fundamentally the the one uh, which upstream Franconia develops, and that you know downstream flows. Um, in, in, into the Rhine. So there had been a series of, uh, of other peoples in occupying the, this territory, the, the Franks in northwest a bit, yes. So there was definitely a connection also with the early Franks, but it was not so, um, let's say, strong in a political sense. Um, you have the Thuringi in the north that uh, will be taken out by the Franks and by the Saxons combined. And in the south, the Alamanni that also would be taken out by the Franks, or at least uh, you know incorporated in the Merovingian Empire, uh, and developing essentially the uh, the, the Swabian uh, stem Dutch. Right. The uh, in the southeast you have the the Bavarians that are also sort of Frankish creation. Um, so the, this the, the latter were Elb Germans. So in in practice, they they belonged to this broader groups, among which there were the Longobards, others that, um, you know, had previously been part of the Swabian Confederacy, and then when the latter broke down, moved south, right, and occupied these areas. Um, there were U the Utungi, for example, um, and uh, the problem is that also archaeologically we do not get 
uh, more info about what was happening there, um, especially in the early times, like uh, at, at the time of the uh, of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Um, we know that at some point there were some important uh, uh, fortifications, like by some local Germanic lords, that, however, are essentially wiped out, or at least they, they declined brutally around the migration era, and we think that essentially the Vandals, the Burgundians, etc. overrun them. Um, the, the Burgundians too had occupied parts of the Main um, uh, Rhine confluence, uh, those uh, would be taken out by the, by the Huns and the Romans, um, combined, deported to some other places, and eventually you have the Frankish conquest, you have the defeat of the Alemanni, the Merovingian expansion in this era, and it seems that it's rather the latter to have caused the, the main collapse. In other words, the Franks didn't want this peripheral area to be populated by strong um, lords, or at least lords could create problems, and so they raised to the ground um, their fortifications and, and things like that. Naturally, they were pretty messed up times. Uh, in the first place, but um, on the longer run, this this um, this space, in fact, remained relatively empty, but was gradually colonized by the uh, the Merovingians, right? That attached to the to the region, um, sort of uh, a sort of importance due to the imperial grandeur, if anything, the name of the Franks, right? The stem duchy of Franconia. Um, emerged, um, and it was at some point, in fact, in the, as we'll see now, the early Middle Ages until the Ottonian era, um, one of the, in fact, original uh, five stem duchies of uh, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. But, um, in Ottonian times, the local uh, nobility was practically ousted, right, of, of the game, of, say, a local say, an original ambition, it was fundamentally secured by the same, uh, the same Ottonians, and as a consequence, throughout the Middle Ages, um, the land wouldn't uh, develop a substantial com political compaction, uh, and was, on the contrary, uh, fragmented, chronically, um, as uh, essentially the, the klein uh pattern uh, fundamentally has been uh, created to describe. Um, yet, uh, such fragmentation would give rise to an impressive amount of uh, free cities, right? concentrated especially in the western part, also the, actually the rise of, of Nuremberg, as, as we were saying before, the largest of the um, uh, German uh, free uh, communes, and also a uh, sea of, of important institutional functions. Um, as we'll see, a Franconian nobility did actually emerge um, in the High Middle Ages, um, but it had to fight uh, its way through the Seine to eventually lose uh, anyway. So some Franconian nobility went on to to make fortune elsewhere, right? As we will see now, the Babenberg feud was caused exactly by the, the Franconian holdings of this family that uh, would famously uh, have greater fortune in the southeast of Germany as the Dukes of Austria. I made a video about, um, about that um, becoming one of the single most powerful feudal lordships uh, in Europe. Um, However, again, the original lands were gradually losing compaction, and albeit becoming the the basis of the Hohenstaufen, and, um, and generally speaking, of royal authority, from 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 some centuries, the monarchs weren't uh, able, or at least they they weren't particularly interested either in concentrating power in there, because they all had other power bases, as we will see, and as we just know uh, from from other videos. So until the beginning of the 6th century, the Eastern Frankish region was um, caught uh, in the area of contrast between the Thuringians and the Alemanni that had been also clashing among uh, one another. 
right? The cosmographer of Ravenna, that is a source uh, writing around um, 700 AD um, from the clergy, writes that the uh, rivers Nab and Regen that, he, that are in today's Upper Palatinate, some of which in fact was historical uh, Franconia, joined the Danube in the land of the Thuringians, which would mean basically that um, around this time uh, and possibly even before that, so in the 5th and the early 6th century even, the Thuringians had expanded um, at least um, up to the uh, upper Franconia, right? We do not have the solid certainty of this, because, again, archaeologically, we do not understand who's voodoo. I mean, the material culture is basically the same for the Franks, the Thuringians, the, the Alamanni, etc., uh, in the area. And so we have just the scanty documentary references um, that, however, would suggest that as a, a sort of um, uh, power vacuum, right, uh, this would be filled by, uh, by other peoples. Um, the expansion of uh, the Thuringians into the area of the river Mine, so this uh, uh, east to west, uh, you know, river uh, making, making Franconia culturally and economically, and so allowing as a base and the, the, the development and also the connection with with the with the Rhine, um, is uh, is also unknown. Right, this this part would, would be actually the most interesting because um, it's, it is um, the, the one that would escape the earlier Frankish influence that was more withdrawn and could still support uh, some political development that however the Franks uh, would uh, occupy um, as quickly as possible uh, uh, given the, the rising opportunity. Now, Upper Franconia appears to have had uh, links with Bohemia at this point, uh, before the, the Frankish conquest. Uh, we understand, again, that Elb Germans were making up the largest part of the population, were some Slavs uh, in the east that had been uh, already occupying, um, in fact, the Bohemian lands. Uh, the uh, heartlands of the present region of Franconia fell um, to the Franks essentially uh, in the moment in which the Alamanni and the Thuringians were defeated, which occurred basically all um, within the, uh, the, the, the first and the fourth decade of the sixth century. Naturally, these populations, especially the, the latter, had um, already being within a sort of Merovingian sphere of influence, at least the, the Alamanni were the most compact, but were crushed, and they would go on like uh, mostly in the same in the same places where they had been settled, but under uh, a Frankish uh, authority. Um, it is established that by the sixth century, uh, Franconia begins to be colonized by the Merovingians. Uh, this started, understandably, from the lower mine, so from from the Rhine, um, and uh, rising the uh, the tributary uh, up. Right, this would make a lot of sense, it's, as we said, what the Romans to uh, had um, done uh, at a point, and this Merovingian uh, infiltration was. We're talking about the, the very early Middle Ages, so it wasn't particularly powerful just per se, but it was relentless, right? And as you know, the Franks w would uh, finally accomplish in the 9th century what not even the Romans had done in, with the conquest of the entirety uh, of Germany. Uh, in the 7th century, Frankish settlers advanced to the area of the Great Arc of the Upper Main and the Rennitz rivers. Shortly after that, um, at least from the uh, mid seventh century, we see uh, the Slavs, right, um, in in the same in the same area. We can track them. The Franks uh, under Dagobert the first that uh, fundamentally uh, 
happened to recompact uh, the Merovingian lands for a while, so could extend his authority further east as well, appointed locally um, as, a, as, a, as a ruler a man named Rodi uh, in the uh, central uh, hub of Würzburg uh, upstream, um, appointing him Dux of the main river uh, land. Right. As we've seen in the video about the uh, Thuringians, it's been speculated that this Rodi was uh, none else than Radolf, the Duke of Thuringia from 632-33 until his death 10 years later, who also successfully rose against the Franks. At a point, the um, Thuringians had been, by this point, curbed, but they retained some, some autonomy and they tried till the end to preserve, in fact, successfully, as a, um, as a just uh, an ethno-linguistic uh, area on, on their own, like the, their own identity, their own political autonomy. Um, besides, um, it's likely that um, by around the same time, the Merovingians had established um, their own duchy uh, in the same area, exactly to uh, counterbalance the uh, Thuringian pressure that had somehow remained in terms of settlement of possible political control um, on this remote uh, eastern frontier. We find lots of burial grounds here, uh, you know, for the sake of completion, Westheim, Dittenheim, Knotzheim, Helmitsheim, Hedstadt, Klein, Langheim, Klepsau, Neubrunn, Niederberg, Sulzheim, Weissenburg, and Zoitzleben. Uh, there are also individual graves or goods from some areas such as Bad Staffelstein, Hirscheid, and Egelsheim. Uh, at this point, Christianity had surely made uh, its appearance in Franconia, but uh, it's likely that the majority of the population still largely followed pagan practices without um, much uh, difference from uh, previous times. Uh, again, in introducing Christianity just like one of the other forces within, you know, their their religious culture was somehow uh, feasible. But in terms of actual evangelization and the establishment of a local church that could accompany, in fact, the, the compaction of a political power in loco, um, it would take the Irish Anglo-Saxon monastic mission, right, and uh, especially uh, the one of Kilian that would become, in fact, the apostle of Franconia. Killian got in Franconia around 685 with his uh, companions uh, Coleman and Thotman. So this Irishman went to Würzburg where um, Killian uh, essentially founded the local church. He became a sort of bishop even though the entire say, uh, Episcopal administration was here quite uh, temporary and somewhat unofficial. In any case, and famously enough, um, Killian was murdered, becoming a, a martyr together with his companions that had suffered the same, uh, the same fate. Around uh, 741-42, the first actual diocese in Franconia is founded by St. Boniface that, as you know, would um, and be martyrized as well, but not in Franconia. The bishopric of Würzburg, that would remain an important spiritual center until the early 19th century, when before secularization, uh, its territory was ceded to uh, to the Bavarian uh, districtuation. Um, around the same year, possibly uh, in the same 742, or maybe a little bit later, St. Willibald founded the bishopric of Eichstätt, which um, included 
uh, the southern eastern parts of uh, Franconia. This was based in, in Bavaria, right? Um, but um, as we were saying before, the um, this uh, the, the 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 boundaries of the stem duchies were just being uh, in this phase, especially before cr official Christianization and so on, just consolidated, right? Uh, but this bishopric um, included, besides the Bavarian, uh, say, part of the Bavarian population, also the Alemannic ones uh, in the west. So it's a bit this corner, um, you know, historically uh, between places like, in fact, uh, Eichstätt, uh, Nördlingen, etc. Uh, until about the 8th century, Franconia. Uh, that was becoming increasingly important for the uh, Frankish rule, still didn't have uh, a proper name on its own. Interestingly enough, from Carolingian times, the mine area was referred to as Francia Orientalis. So, properly the name that, uh, since Louis the Pius, would be adopted for uh, describing what, uh, in fact, the Eastern Frankish kingdom as a whole, so this... Um, Teutonic Kingdom, this proto Germanies was finally being established. Um, and uh, this is fascinating because it tells you how the Franks reasoned this. Uh, this was an area that could be partly, it was even some some part of Frankish ancestral lands that could overlap with it historically, but more than else it had been again uh, colonized by the Franks from an early age and it had become Per se, like the the, the how how do you call the the place out there in the east, um, the East Frankenland? So let's call all this broader territory out to the Elbe, etc. Like like it because it's more or less yeah you know, the same thing uh, as a frontier. Um, and admittedly, the 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 same Franks were especially the Carolingians as Austrasians somehow close to places like uh, Saxony, Thuringia, they had historically just uh, at some point even dynastically uh, intertwined their, their histories and so on. So um, it, it's difficult to trace a specific boundary, uh, even less a bo specific border. In any case, um, uh, this um, this land uh, had an evident uh, potential, mostly the, the mine basin, uh, the confluence with the Rhine, uh, and also the possibility to um, join the Rhine with the Danube with some sort of work. In fact, this is what Charlemagne uh, seemingly tried to do. Um, it's all a bit foggy historically, but uh, there may have been under him the attempt to um, establish essentially a channel uh, connecting a navigable one, uh, connecting the river Altmühl and the Swabian Redzat, right? That's basically uniting the uh, Rhine and the uh, Danubian uh, waterways. The site of this Fossa Carolina or Karlsgraben, as this channel in fact uh, was called, would be near to, in fact, today what is still called Graben at Treustlingen, yet all the historical circumstances of this affair um, are disputed. Uh, like later on it would be other canals um, and so on, but that, that's in fact also another story. Um, in the mid-9th century uh, we witness the affirmation of a stem duchy of Franconia that fundamentally was fueled by the consolidation of Carolingian power uh, in in the region, the general uh, you know importance of the traffic, especially between the Main and the Rhine. You know that the area, like the Upper Rhine, especially, was the center of um, European metallurgic work. Like arms and armor were were exported. Uh, substantially up to northern Europe, the Vikings uh, had uh, had quite a liking of Frankish blades and, and such things, uh, and it it was historically like an area bit like borderline with what had been the 
Roman Germany, so it had some potential exposure to civilization, to the, the general compaction of of properly what Carolingian Europe emerges like, right, even after the the disgregation of the empire with its compactness, its monasteries, its interconnection, um, its own, uh, let's say, common language politically uh, among the, the aristocracies. Um, everything gets rationalized, in fact, under the control of the rising uh, lords. Um, that, uh, in fact, uh, own now a sense of uh, Franconian identity, politically, juridically, to defend in front of uh, of the king uh, and of of the emperor, they feel uh, rightfully uh, important players uh, in the Eastern Frankish kingdom. Um, the present day Franconia, uh, however, covers uh, only the eastern part of the duchy. Right, everything that comprises the, the west. Uh, part of it, so the the Rhenish Franconia, as it's called, it now belongs to other lenda, namely uh, Hesse, the Rhenish Hesse, the Palatinate region, the north of Baden, um, as we were saying, also some parts of uh, modern Thuringia, south of the Rheinsteig path uh, included. Um, in the 9th century, we also witnessed the rise of the Babenberg family. At the time, actually known as the Poponents, right? They uh, were called Babenberg because they came from Bamberg, actually. Um, and that would play a dramatic role, especially as Austrian dukes and margraves later on in the, in the high, uh, mi in high Middle Ages. These uh, noblemen were a Franconian house, right, that uh, owned a significant amount of wealth in the mine basin, thus the best of the duchy. But exactly because of their power, a rift developed between them and the Carolingian kings, which was definitely not a, uh, you know, very positive uh, event for the at least the, uh, the peaceful development of your own uh, affairs. Um, and in fact, what happens is that Louis the Child, uh, Louis the Third, Louis the Fourth, he's actually named um, different ways. However, King of the Eastern Franks from 899 until his death, that uh, occurred in 911, seized after an important quarrel with, um, with the proponents slash Babenbergs, a number of the uh, latter's estates, granting them to the members of the Conradine clan, that was also a Franconian uh, noble clan um, from the Rhenish part, by the way. So you have an interesting contrast, because at this point, we're looking at the Eastern Frankish Kingdom basically on its own, because the, the broader empire has basically collapsed. So um, the uh, uh, initially, you know, that the center of Eastern Frankish power was pretty close to these places. That is in Regensburg, that is on the Danube, south uh, of Franconia, uh, in Bavaria. And so, if you look at the position here, you have some strong proponents that are essentially close there, along, having possessions ar along the mine. Um, and so the, the Carolingians favor instead the, the guys were from the other side of Franconia, towards the Rhine, so it's far away. Um, and uh, essentially uh, hoping to, to, to centralize, at least it, w it was very contingent as a political choice admittedly, but to, to consolidate a Franconian power that would be more distant from the main uh, center of power of the Carolingians, uh, which would uh, extinguish themselves soon. Right. But this triggered, anyway, the so-called Babenberg feud, as the many is that, uh, many actually that broke out in Germany because of the same identical uh, struggles of power. 
And obviously enough, Franconia was the theater of a fierce clash between the Conradines and the Babenbergs. Right? Uh, in the end, most of um, the, the Papponid estates, including Bamberg herself, after, after which, as we've seen, they took the, the house took the name, were seized. Right? Uh, when uh, Louis the Child died, Conrad I of the Conradine uh, line was um, Duke of Franconia and exercised a significant rule over the region. And not only, but on, on the entire Teutonic Kingdom, so much so that he was elected himself in Forkheim, the monarch of East France. Conrad gave um, uh, regional uh, authority over the Duchy of Franconia during his uh, reign to his own brother, Eberhard. However, at the death of Conrad, Henry, the Fowler, Duke of Saxony, was elected uh, in turn as Eastern Frankish king, and the Conradines, uh, Conradines fought with the Ottonians uh, over the control of, of, of these lands for also other dynastic implications that we have observed also for, for the Duchy of Saxony in, in, the, in the relative video that you can check out in my Medieval Germany playlist. Uh, Eberhard fell in the Battle of Andernach in 939, fighting Otto, um, not yet the Great, because this is the time in which Henry the Fabler is still uh, in charge, but, you know, Otto was uh, already distinguishing himself for his uh, warlike energy. The defeat of the Conradines um, and their extinction, de facto, um, brought uh, Franconia uh, to uh, essentially uh, abort that process of uh, ducal consolidation. Franconia would be, um, come fundamentally subordinated to the German kings. Uh, again, not much because it was simply an institutional appanage that, you know, any elected ruler could uh, take control of. Naturally, the Ottonians made it um, safe for them to, uh, to, to acquire uh, significant control uh, on the region, but you know that the Eastern Frankish Kingdom was quite turbulent and that uh, the wars here has not even began. Um, and um, as a consequence, uh, the uh, Franconia would remain a, a land of, um, of content, basically. And because of such instability, uh, it wouldn't develop into a local compact power, right? Unlike uh, Saxony, Bavaria, or, or Sweden. Otto I endowed the Schweinfurt counts, who probably descended from the, uh, from the Babenbergs, uh, with numerous offices, such as the Episcopal See in Würzburg, and made uh, these guys count of the most important Franconian Gauss, originally villages, but at this point districts, in fact, comital ones. Um, this, this passage is interesting because, as you understand, the Ottonians uh, didn't simply walk into Franconia. They had to uh, give power to someone locally, to essentially exercise it uh, on their behalf. They had to dislodge also the, the clientels that had been loyal to the Conradines, that had, as we've seen, fought um, against uh, the same Saxons. So it was a delicate situation because uh, the, the Eastern Frankish king didn't control, but uh, essentially their own ethnic bases of power, mostly in this case, the Ottonians, uh, Saxony. But Franconia is associated, especially, in, fa in fact, in Ottonian times, to uh, the imperial grandeur, right? The Saxons brought the warlike, brutal, kind of, you know, um, traditional uh, um, mentality of, of, the, uh, of the Eastern Frankish natives. Um, the Franconians brought the 
imperial grandeur uh, because of it was by now the land of the Franks, right? It was called like that because the same region it was, by the way, also substantially developed as we will see. It wasn't like um, you know. Um, uh, a broken state because it was poor. On the contrary, it was particularly florid, um, and uh, this was naturally a, a very good reason to to come to control it and to prevent, given this uh, conditions of political subordination, like some local uh, rulers simply consolidate some greater power. So a great opportunity for all the. Uh, as we'll see now, the, the, the Ottonians, the Salians, the Hohenstaufen, even the Habsburgs initially um, in the 13th century, um, to the detriment of the local political compaction. No. Um, the Franconians, how did they react? I mean, they, they were local lords, of course, as we've seen it. So, well, they, generally speaking, were aware of their um, of their frailty, right? Because... Uh, this was a bit like with the ecclesiastical principalities. Uh, the weaker ones, the ones that had, generally speaking, less power, etc., were the first ones to lose from the disgregation of monarchic power. The great, strong stem duchies were normally um, carrying out the, the greater resistance to uh, centralization. These ones, instead, were happy to support the monarchy. And, in fact... Um, the Franconians remained loyal to the crown under uh, Otto and his immediate successors. Otto the Great, for example, often stationed in uh, in Franconia, right? Uh, including the time in 957 when he met with his rebellious son, Ludolf of Swabia. Uh, we made a video about uh, Alamannia and Alpine Resch, and we've seen it in, in that case. This was an Ottonian, it was the actual son of the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, who was sent by his father to rule the, the Swabians that were a bit defiled and trying to, you know, you know to sneak away um, from, from royal um, control. And in order to rule Swabia, the Ludolf had to satisfy the, the local nobility even by going at war against his father. Uh, the, uh, the event was, say, the, the rebellion was brought down, and... Um, Otto met with his son in Zenna, today Langenzen, in the Palatinate near Nuremberg in, in Franconia. In 973, uh, Otto II transferred the important fortress of uh, Babenburg, as it was known at the time, but it would be Bamberg, right, as it's known today. So you understand the Babenburg, where, where the name comes from, um, to the powerful. Duke of Bavaria. It was um, Herod Wrangler to win him over. So this triggered actually a, a, a rebellion which was crushed uh, together with essentially the, the Bavarians themselves. Right? Uh, the Ottonians had two branches. One, I mean, the, the original one was the Saxon one and then the Bavarians that were in parallel and coping mostly with the Magyars. Um, at this point, even harder than than Henry the Fowler and Otto I did at Riad and, and Lechfeld. Um, but the Ottonian propaganda was more famous historiographically, so sorry, Bavaria. But that, that's, that's unfortunately how it goes sometimes. Um, in any case, um, you understand that Franconia is a bit in between. At least there's Thuringia um, north of it between uh, Franconia and Saxony. Uh, but it was a crucial land as far as the balance of these two branches was uh, was concerned. Uh, so a lot of inf political infiltration from both sides. Um, under Otto III, the son of Henry the Wrangler, uh, essentially would become Henry II, the last uh, Ottonian emperor, was given his Bavarian duchy back after the, the previous rebellion, um, which allowed him, in fact, to be uh, later elected king um, at the death of Otto III in 1002. Um, Henry arranged beforehand uh, to secure the support, especially of the Schweinfurt counts uh, in, uh, in, in, in Franconia. Right? Uh, there was specifically a promise made to them 
to confer the entire Duchy of Bavaria, that, by the way, at this point was very big, right? And it wasn't just the one with being the late medieval time, it was an enormous thing, comprised even parts of Italy, it was like an enormous region. Um, so I don't know even how realistically, you know, this promise could work, but, you know, the, this, the Duchy of Bavaria would have entirely gi been given to uh, the Count Henry of Schweinfurt, uh, was also the Margrave of the Nordgau, and, um, and known as the glory of Eastern Franconia by his own cows, and there was the famous chronicler Tithmar of Merseburg, so there was at least some kind of ambition there that could uh, bait for this. But in fact, in the German royal election of 1002, this promise was not um, maintained, because the guy actually voted for for Henry was um, elected a uh, German sovereign, but of course Bavaria was not given to to the Council of Schweinfurt. Actually, it would remain the, the main power base of the same Henry. Um, but this had uh, a bitter consequence because the uh, Schweinfurts joined actually the, the royal uh, opposition and began uh, yet another feud, in fact, known as the Schweinfurt one. They lost, anyway. So this also shows that there was no consistent power in Franconia just to simply start these things and getting anywhere with them accordingly. Um, in spite of this, however, we are in the 11th century and castellation has kicked in consistently, a bit of feudalism, uh, even though in Germany it was a bit more uh, superficial, was rendering ever more possible to dislodge these noblemen from their own holdings. In fact, Herzberg, uh, Kreuzen, Kronach, Burg, Kunstadt, and Banz um, were maintained by uh, Henry of Schweinfurt, um, while he lost uh, his comital estates and royal uh, fiefdoms. Right. Uh, so his power was actually greatly uh, reduced, but still he was uh, a lord of the land. Five years later, uh, Henry II of Germany founded the bishopric of Bamberg. Henry II would be canonized later. Bamberg, the, this diocese, was provided with rich estates. The, the idea was, again, I am the new king, so that there's this um, fragmented Franconia. I can start simply establishing here some more concentrated royal power, right? That is going to remain in my hands. Naturally, when when you say in my hands, it's literally the private possessions of these kings that didn't have uh, any public authority that was not their private one, right? From their estates, their their assets. Um, this was true, of course, for all these kings, but they, they were working really hard to establish something more centralized in a land that, as we've seen, was ruled effectively through, uh, through election, so was not so monarchically oriented like, say, were already Western Frank in spite of the fragmentation or uh, what would have been um, established half a century later as the... Uh, as the Anglo-Norman kingdom. Uh, Bamberg became also a preferred Pfalz, that is um, a, essentially a residence, right, the, the sea of a, of a, of a, an imperial abode, uh, and as such an important center of the king, because the court was itinerant, and um, Bamberg acquired this prestigious function of hosting the king and working, you know, uh, to to support his his function. Interestingly enough, uh, Henry II, as well as Pope Clement II, are buried in the Cathedral of Bamberg. The reason for the Pope is that it, he had been once the Bishop of Bamberg. Uh, here we are in the late Ottonian era, and um, as you know, the bishop counts also in, in Italy, including the, the Roman ones, were normally uh, German appointees. Um, and Bamberg was so important at this point that when the Pope died, they buried him in, 
in Germany, which is the only exception, because popes, uh, except Clement II, were always buried south uh, of the Alps, right? Uh, since parts of the bishopric of Würzburg also fell to Bamberg, um, Henry II thought to compensate uh, this uh, diocese by uh, providing it with several royal estates as a fiefdom, uh, meaning that, of course, these the, the local lords were not to be disregarded simply because there was no more compact uh, power. Um, you have the Meininger Mark uh, and the royal estate of Meiningen in Grabefeldgau given to the bishopric of Würzburg. The most important areas uh, in the present-day land of Franconia were, apart from other imperial centers uh, or, uh, or at least imperial supporters such as bishoprics or allodial estates, uh, especially this increased in in Swabian times, the uh, Meranian lands the, and the counties of Henneberg Greifenstein, Wildberg, Rieneck, Wertheim, Kastel, Hohenlohe, Truhendingen, and Abendberg. Um, the Duchy of Merania was uh, particularly uh, relevant too, right? They would be recognized eventually as princes of the empire enjoying imperial immediacy, uh, which means that basically they couldn't be. Uh, commanded by anyone by but but the emperor uh, himself this is in part what's also the same reason of the free for the, the, the important concentration of imperial free cities in Franconia is is, is called by uh, however here we are a bit before the Swabians uh, there are the Salians the Franconians properly um, who in fact uh, are actually Saxon in origin um, and that uh, enjoy, however, significant power in, in the region. Henry III um, um, is um, the, the ruler under whom Nuremberg is first recorded. We are in 1050, right? And the sovereign expands the city uh, for uh, increasing his royal authority. At that point, uh, Bamberg had become so powerful, in fact, that uh, the sovereigns thought it was better to dilute a bit uh, her uh, her wealth. Um, and as a consequence, territories like Langensen or areas south of Forkheim were cut off from uh, the uh, the city. Also, the Bamberg forests in the proximity of Nuremberg were declared as Reichswälderne, that is, imperial forests. Um, in Germany, the uh, imperial forests were, of course, the equivalent of, the, for example, the royal forests in, in other countries that were not even necessarily woods per se, but in Germany quite so, because, of course, in the 11th century, the land was quite wild, still heavily forested, covered in you know, wooden swamps and you know, all to to work out, maybe. but especially as it would happen uh, with the Ost Zidlung uh, within the same Germany uh, in the in the following centuries, um, and they often separated uh, the same the same stem duchies uh, historically, and they were quite remunerative, right? Because you could graze, um, make the the pigs graze uh, there. You you could get timber, etc. And the various lords were extremely um, jealous of of their own of their own forests, so this was a great move, uh, like against uh, Bamberg, at least for what she had always enjoyed, uh, this forest like. Also, the um, market rights of Fürth were transferred from Bamberg to Nuremberg. Right, this is the moment in which the latter center starts to to switch um, to the most important. Uh, in in the in the region, at the time of Henry IV, however, problems break out in Germany, um, at least more than usual because of the investor struggle, right? So, 
uh, this means that uh, the country, I mean Germany entirely, uh, or at least with very few uh, exceptions, turns against the excommunicated emperor. It is also pursuing, of course, an Italian policy still and so on. And in this chaos, Forkheim and Fürth were recovered by Bamberg in, in, the, in the process, showing, of course, how they, they would they wouldn't that they hadn't appreciated particularly to be deprived of of such assets. Uh, this was a mess because Bavaria, Swabia, and Saxony rebelled against Henry IV. Um, in Franconia, as a whole, however, remained uh, one of the most important support bases for the monarch. The bishopric of Bamberg, as we just uh, observed. Um, it benefited from the situation. However, he still remained loyal to the to the monarch because uh, he knew that um, if the uh, you know if the Salians had uh, declined, still uh, Franconia was vulnerable. Uh, and so, even in in this investiture controversy, it was better better to stick to, to the king, right? Um, this is also how the Swabians, the Oenstaufen, actually gained uh, importance from a relatively modest background, because they were basically the only ones to, to still support uh, the king, even at the peak of the crisis with, with, with the papacy. Um, the bishop of Würzburg instead uh, sided against uh, Henry, and in 1077... Uh, elected Rudolf of Rheinfelden as counter king in Forkheim. Right. This anti king wasn't able, however, to prevail over Henry, who would be succeeded eventually by his um, homonymous son, Henry V. And, however, the, uh, the Franconian. Uh, Autonomy was not uh, as uh, resumed, right? The uh, the general sense that this land was now tied to the destinies of the monarchy was evident. In fact, uh, with the next dynasty, the Hohenstaufen, um, especially during the reigns of Conrad the Third and Frederick Barbarossa, Franconia became really a, a major. Uh, a base for uh, the Swabian policy. Würzburg and Nuremberg became ever greater bases of support for the Hohenstaufen. At that time, the former was, by the way, one of the largest um, centers north of the Alps, uh, with four to five thousand inhabitants, which may not seem a lot, but especially for Germany, this is. This means really a great concentration of power. And you understand that, again, cities normally work, right, just in any other monarchy at this point, for the monarchy normally. Because they are, they especially in Germany, they do not really have a, um, you know, essentially an autonomy outside of their city walls. Um, there is a prince, whether lay or ecclesiastical, they're not, city-states, they're just towns, but as such they care very much about the uh, the stability of the country, of trade, of an institution that can recognize their liberty, at least within their own city walls. Um, so this is really a big deal. Uh, in 1190-1191, the youngest son of the Emperor Frederick um, I, uh, that is Philip of Swabia, became the bishop elect, that he's essentially the chosen, um, pointed by, by the king, Bishop of Würzburg. Um, and this guy was essentially destined for a career uh, in the church, but when his brother, the Emperor Henry VI of Oenstaufen, died prematurely in 1196, uh, he um, essentially took the throne as his uh, successor. Right. Uh, this would make him also one of the few uh, literate um, German monarchs uh, of the time. I made a video about Philip, actually, who was assassinated just after his uh, very difficult election. Um, Otto of Brunswick would become the, the next ruler. 
Um, in any case, the connection with Würzburg is is noticeable uh, in this for this video's sake. Um, Frederick II of Oenstaufen, just like his grandfather, built new Swabian centers of power in Franconia, namely imperial palaces, Falzen, um, such as Gelnhausen, Seligenstadt, and Wimpfen, also extending the Hohenstaufen imperial rights between uh, Rothenburg, Obdurtaube, fantastic uh, medieval town, if you've ever visited, you know that, Nürslingen, we mentioned before, and Nuremberg, right? Um, so we're talking about imperial rights, these are theoretically public rights, but de facto are essentially the ones controlled through this public system by the Swabians, right, as a direct, direct as um, an accessible property. Um, these are the magic times, of course, of Germany, uh, where in the, the 13th century, the peak of the Swabian era is the the, the the era of the famous Minnesenga. And in fact, a famous poet, Wolfram von Eschenbach, is said, but we, we're not uh, dramatically sure of that, to have been originally of, uh, in fact, uh, Eschenbach, that is known today as Wolfram's, in fact, Saxon genitive, Eschenbach. Um, that is in, in historical Franconia, but in the district of Ansbach in, in Bavaria. Just yet another example of how Franconia was somehow uh, cannibalized by, by, in part by, by the neighbors uh, historically. Now, um, originally, um, the uh, royal authority was almost entirely supported by the bishops in Franconia. This was also normal. Uh, as in other lands, the bishops, as we just said, especially the ones of the Rhineland, tended to support the monarchy because they weren't as powerful as the lay princes, and so they wanted to, just by intelligence, stick into civilization. Um, there were, however, some several powerful lay noblemen who managed to succeed uh, in securing power within within Franconia. The, the most important ones were the counts of Rhenek, uh, that is also like uh, a domain that is today in, in northwestern Bavaria, the counts of Wertheim, the house of Hohenlohe uh, in the west, the counts of Henneberg, Truendingen and Orlamünde in the north, and the Schlüsselberg and Counts of Castel in the center. Um, there were also um, ministeriales in, in Franconia, especially in the south, because uh, this was the most uh, Swabian influenced one. And you know that southern Germany at this point relied 90% of, of her numerically of, of her uh, knights properly on, on these. Uh, technically serves, right, serve and knights that are typical of Germany, and that were a bit like the the iron arm of the, especially of the Swabians, but generally speaking of any royal power uh, in this, in the heart of the German Middle Ages. Uh, the Pappenheim family of ministeriales was particularly important because it shielded Franconia from the Duchy of Bavaria, uh, in the south. The Andex family, that were originally Bavarians, occupied a dominant position in Upper Franconia within uh, the Duchy of Merania until the death of Otto III, uh, that was also Count of Burgundy from 1231, uh, and the last Duke of Merania from 1234 to his death, in, uh, in fact, in 1248, when um, this land with this domain was divided among other ruling families that were just awaiting for such things to happen on a regular basis. Um, there is an important pre uh, presence of the Teutonic Order in Franconia, right, that started holding wealthy estates in the region, built lots of castles um, and towns. Some Franconian towns, coats of arms, bear witness of this presence. 
the counts of Zollern, so the ones that would become the Hohenzollern, so the unifiers of, of Germany in 1871, um, the you know, the Prussian leaders that were actually Swabian themselves in origin, right? Just like the uh, the Hohenstaufen, and the Habsburgs, uh, and so on, uh, rose to significant power, however, in function of Franconia, because they inherited uh, the Burgraviate of Nuremberg, that we'll talk about, because it was just a small entity. Um, it was the only Burgraviate, um, that again reflects the importance of the city in as much as it was considered like I don't know another a margraviate it was like sort of um, lay principality but that was founded on on this city in 1192 um, then from from there it would have uh, a future on their own uh, uh, further north that was more even more successful but that's uh, another story. But this, this connected the Hohenzollern to, as the Burgraves uh, of Nuremberg to royal and imperial policy from an early age. During the so-called Great Interregnum between 1254 and 1273 that I made a couple of videos on already, um, the, uh, say, German political landscape was characterized, as you know, uh, by a un, uh, relatively unchecked uh, expansion of the private power of the princes. Right At this point, there was no strong monarch, um, and uh, the, the cause of this was the same German princes essentially not choosing a stronger one until the rise of Rudolf of Habsburg that was actually also elected because it was thought to be not an ineffective but still a relatively uh, modest uh, individual in power. Instead, he managed to seize the entire Ulster and like the entire southeastern Germany actually, um, together with his uh, you know uh, ancestral Swabian possessions. Um, in any case, um, at that point, it was evident that the attempt to establish a um, say national monarchy like in England and France, uh, had failed in Germany, right? And so all the system now was trying still to play according to the rules of what had been traditionally uh, the, the federal, essentially, um, uh, system of the, uh, the Germanic kingdom, uh, and reinforcing ever more their own private assets, uh, and ruling from, from that base without even too much of a center, even searching to actually expand in uh, not even the, the, the most, what had historically been the, the most, um, uh, uh, say, important regions of, of the country, like the Saxons, the Franconians, the, the Swabians had all ruled from, say, a Western, um, uh, from a Western mm, point of view, let's say. Uh, while now things were especially looking better, at least for a more uh, concentrated power, right, in places like, in fact, Austria, Bohemia, uh, etc. Now, aside from this, um, uh, the, uh, the, the interregnum did not affect the capacity of the German rulers to control Franconia. As a matter of fact, yes, the, the land surely suffered from the erosion of public rights that were either sold or simply taken over, but this specific region still uh, found a strong royal following, right, uh, after the, uh, especially after the, the rise of Rudolf of Habsburg, right, uh, that um, essentially was allowed to cross the land, for example. And we had also uh, some some preference for this Rhine main uh, area. Considered that Rudolf would destroy something like 70 castles in, in the Rhineland alone, right? So this was an important power base, given that, again, he was from Swabia, he had some holdings there, but mostly was also ruling from Austria, so... Um, he could use Franconia as a sort of bridge, right? Uh, at least 
you know, it, in there were some problems, uh, admittedly, in that, because there was Bavaria in between, but never mind, they found some compromises, also because he was actually king of the Romans, and he had been elected as such. In any case, the sword, as you understand, was also the, the, uh, the, the, the way to, to make policy, uh, policy even more than before. Um, Franconia, in spite of this, however, didn't uh, develop a more concentrated power on her own. Actually, this is the moment in which her condition of Kleinstadt um, boomed, uh, in a sense. Next to the dioceses of Würzburg and Bamberg, uh, and what had already been the great nobility, there were lots of uh, Ritterschaften, that is, um, say, knightly estates, uh, in spite of the crisis of the ministerialists that would basically bring to an end to this sort of, um, say, uh, estate as such, at least in the servile condition by, by the, in the 14th century. Um, there was also more kind of, uh, you know, fragmented outlook when this uh, knights, uh, albeit uh, servants in origin, had become sometimes even more powerful than the uh, the free nobility, right? So it was just like uh, not really a free for all because everything came at a cost, but it was just um, a power struggle based on sheer brutal power, right? Without much possibility of some. Uh, uh, royal scale intervention like it had somewhat functionally worked um, up to the previous centuries. Now you could still have that but you had to pay something in exchange and as we just said the main centers of power were moving away also from the from the boundaries of of, um, of Franconia, right? Uh, or better, the, the Wittelsbachs, yes in Bavaria were somehow powerful but the uh, the Habsburgs were in Austria, the Luxembourgs would be in Bohemia, so Swabia was a bit left uh, on its own to a point. Um, yeah, the, the Rhineland also followed this pattern of further, uh, if not further fragmentation, but just of complete loosening of, of, of control um, of the, the major uh, princes that became much more, uh, say, in, independent. Uh, in nature. Um, there were, however, three cities of the empire, the Freie Reichsstädte, uh, who uh, maintained, especially in the, in the western part of Franconia, a uh, great relevance, right? Um, the, uh, the, other than that, the influence of the emperor in secular and spiritual principalities was very restricted. These uh, cities, however, had uh, a sense of their own uh, status, right? They would respond still to the emperor, and that was basically the function for which they had been created, and they at least could support him logistically for his expeditions, etc. Under Louis um, the Fourth of Wittelsbach, known as the Bavarian, the imperial city of Nuremberg benefited especially from many new privileges, right? Uh, you see here what, what we were saying before, that the, the, the bordering um, uh, powers are interested, of course, in this fragmentation. Nuremberg is already a, a large center. Um, Louis is very, uh, you know, practically minded he is the one who made Munich the you know the, the center uh, not properly the, the absolute center because capitals didn't quite exist uh, not even Vienna technically was for, for the Habsburgs at this point but still you know the, the important center of, of, of Bavaria even though the land was fragmented in various branches in the 14th century um, uh, and uh, like Nuremberg was uh, chosen this uh, urban boosting policy of of the of the Bavarian emperor, so that it grew stronger in trade, uh, in just in political weight in the empire, um, and increasing its its size, right? Uh, 
just an anecdote, the imperial regalia or insignia of the Holy Roman Emperor were kept in Nuremberg from 1423 onwards, so that this center was recognized as sort of, of a bridge um, in, in the center of Germany to crawl from east to west, from north to south, uh, etc. Um, from the time that the uh, aforementioned counts of Zollern were awarded with the Margraviate of Brandenburg, about which I made a video, here we are in 1415, their Franconian possessions were also designated as Margraviate, right? So that this brought to the elevation of some Franconian lands to higher uh, institutional status. There was a war, um, it's known in fact as the First Margrave War for, from 1449-50 um, between the uh, Free Imperial City of Nuremberg and Albrecht the Third Achilles, that was the elector of Brandenburg, um, Brandenburg Ansbach, um, and it was being fought essentially for the supremacy over Franconia entirely, right? And this could uh, be achieved only capturing the free imperial city for how it had been consolidating at this point. Consider the aforementioned Burgraviate wasn't controlling the, the commune as such, right? So be aware of this, that you can have a role as a feudal lord. We've seen it in other videos, for example, like, I don't know, the one of the county of Toulouse. Toulouse was a commune, but it was also, it was also the seat of the count, right? So here, um, Nuremberg had, as an imperial uh, free city, naturally a, a, an actual uh, freedom on her own, and uh, Albert failed in uh, capturing her. He, he besieged the city, but he failed in capturing it, right? And um, the Margrave uh, had to, to give up, right? To so simply confine himself uh, into his original estates. Um, Albert uh, eventually bequeathed his eldest son and heir with the Margraviate of Brandenburg. And his other sons, who were Frederick and Sigmund, were given with, uh, were provided with the areas of Ansbach uh, and Kulmbach. Uh, these are also today in, in Bavaria, by the way. Um, these were the Franconian territories of the Zollerns um, that would um, essentially gather into independent principalities uh, later on. Um, the, let's say, the, the difficulty in consolidating more power locally uh, uh, can be exemplified by the failed efforts uh, of such a powerful ecclesiastical prince such as the Bishop of Würzburg in building a larger contiguous territorial power, right? Um, the city of Nuremberg was, if, if we want, the most prosper um, estate, right? It uh, managed to defeat uh, the Zollerns um, and by the end of the Middle Ages was really the largest imperial commune uh, in all the kingdom of Germany, which is really, really impressive, and you can admire the city and her medieval vestiges still today. Right, just know that the center had again been serving the, the Hohenstauf and had already been a, a great important um, town, uh, and it had been boosted especially for, for this function. Um, if anything, the, the main plague of Franconia which is typical 4th and 15th century in Europe, was the spread of practically robber barons, uh, including the, the famous Epiline of Geilingen, um, that reflected uh, the general uh, late medieval crisis of the lower estates, uh, the fact that even though the ministeriales had gained their own freedom because nobody really remembered their servile origin anymore and their power was just equal to one of other knights, well, also the latter was, was, was falling, so uh, the German knights actually 
uh, are bullied by the the local princes that are consolidating um, their power t- territorially um, after the the 14th century crisis, and a lot of them go abroad, mostly in Italy, to fight as mercenaries. Right? Some would go to Scandinavia and even take over um, the, the local kingdoms um, at a point, and made a, a bit of, about Denmark, Norway, Sweden. The same thing happens uh, there. Um, and uh, and the Franconians were no less than, than the others, let's say, and actually exactly because of the, the greater fragmentation, it was a greater crisis, and lots of these people went abroad, right, uh, at least fortunately for, for the locals, because otherwise they would have just, uh, as many did, remained there and caused a bit of a problem, right? But you can argue that, you know, the, the, the other princes didn't behave very differently, and just that was the dialectic of power um, by that point in time. Now, naturally, there are lots of interesting uh, stories about early modern uh, Franconia, for example, the Frankische Reichskreis, um, but, uh, you know, with the time of Maximilian I, but perhaps we will treat this in a, in a new modern history uh, series. Uh, for today, I instead stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.